a meeting with Scott Hagerman of 5050rights.org. And we're going to talk today, Scott, about domestic violence and how it's utilized in Utah, what, what happens when domestic violence claims are made, and what kind of credibility we ought to give them. Is that correct? Yes. So before we go any, uh, any farther with this, uh, would you tell the people, uh, people that are watching, what is 5050rights.org? Uh, that's kind of a, I guess, a brainchild I came up with a few years ago. I had been through uh, the divorce from hell. I went through that a few years back. I um, had a temporary marriage where it got even worse, I guess you could say. I mm -hmm. uh, was a victim of false allegations and also a victim of domestic violence myself. So I, I started this page, um, a Facebook page, turned into a website. Um, the focus of our organization and a lot of the people that have liked our page is shared parenting, uh, stopping some of the abuse that happens with domestic violence laws, and also making sure that there's accountability for uh, those who actually do domestic violence so that the victims can actually have some type of, of recourse. Well now I know that if any of you tuned out before he finished his sentence, there's going to be some people that will watch and go, oh, okay, somebody with an agenda somebody with an ax to grind and if you ask me I'd say well that's a fair question to ask so what would you say to people that's like okay you're one of those bitter dads who claims that women r railroaded him and the system was terrible and all that kind of stuff and so what would you say to those who would think that I can would say that there's literally thousands of other people that have gone through the exact same thing and um, it's not just me. I, I typically don't talk very much about my own personal story uh, and any of the work that I do on, on our page itself uh, or on our site. We try and focus more on the statistics, the studies that have been done, uh, the hard facts, not really personal stories and, and personal things that happen. And that's why I asked Scott to meet with me because these, these podcasts and these videos are all about you learning information. I'm not here to share opinions unless I come right out and tell you I'm going to share an opinion or my guest is going to share an opinion. And so, Scott, I'm sure you're going to have some opinions here and there, but this will be for the purpose, because he knows this is going to be for the purpose of helping you understand how domestic violence is treated generally in Utah, how the law works, and some of the things that you may not have known about domestic violence and how it gets reported and how it gets treated. That would be safe to say? Yes. All right. Well, what would you like to start with? What are we going to talk about first? Well, the first thing, and I think you kind of uh, leaned into that a little bit, a lot of times when somebody wants to talk about domestic violence, talk about false allegations, the first thing that comes out is that they're somebody that either hates women or hates men if it's a woman that's talking. Um, that's one of the things that has really set back true reform in domestic violence back for, for years and years. People know that there's an issue. Uh, we have attorneys who've experienced domestic violence. Uh, just this last year, there was a legislator uh, from back east, while he was a legislator, that was um, accused of domestic violence in his custody case. That was uh, something that went all over the news. Uh, Representative Atkins, and I apologize, I can't remember the state, but it, it's something that the people live. Um, I'm one, one thing I wanted to say, I guess, in regards to that, there's also a judge. When it's interesting when you see a judge or you see a legislator, or you see an attorney or somebody who's been typically on the one end of the system be thrown into those types of circumstances. Uh, in Georgia, there was a judge, Rucker Smith, and he had a girlfriend, uh, turned into an ex-girlfriend, and evidently things didn't really go too well when that relationship changed status. Uh, she ended up assaulting him. He was the victim of domestic violence. He did what any rational thinking person would do, not male or female, and he dialed 911. Uh, the, he, even though he was the victim, he was the one that was actually charged with the crime. Uh, she didn't have any type of accountability or anything happened to her. The charges were later dropped, as they often are, and actually about 70% of cases with domestic violence, those charges are dropped because they don't meet the burden of proof for criminal conviction. What would you say, though, about people, and again, if I sound a little condescending, I mean to, but some people would say, well, 70%, that may be the number, but that's because a lot of people are afraid to have, the, have their significant other prosecuted. What would you say to that? Well, if they're not afraid to... Um, I don't say <laughs> make the report. To, yeah, to make, to make the report, if they're, they're not will, afraid to, to call the police to have their their spouse or their boyfriend or girlfriend hauled away in a police car, 
I don't understand where that that fear all of a sudden comes out. Um, obviously, th there are true victims of domestic violence. Nobody wants those victims to be um, victimized even further. But on the other end, when you have somebody who's making false allegations, it ends up turning and it basically takes the true victims and it makes their stories not really believable. That, that judge I was mentioning, he actually, um, during his case, he actually opined something I'd just like to share with you. He said, uh, uh, for someone to falsely accuse another out of anger and vengeance silences the voices of the many real victims. And that's something that um, I can attest for myself. You, you have somebody who is a real victim of domestic violence, and because you have all these false allegations, the police resources, CPS, uh, victim advocates, everybody's resources, everybody's tax money is going to help these people who make these false allegations just so that they can get ahead in a custody case or maybe they can get possession of the house or the car or the finances or all of the above. Now, just briefly, because I don't want to get off on a tangent, I, as I can sometimes tend to do, how would a protective order get you the house? How would the protective order get you things that have nothing to do with your personal safety? We have, if we take it back to the Violence Against Women Act, um, that was passed federally a number of years ago. And as with most laws, there were great intentions when that was passed. People want to help victims. And that's something that's, that I would want to do. That's something I'm sure you would want to do. You, but unfortunately, there's always those unintended consequences. As a result of the Violence Against Women Act, over 1,500 pieces of legislation around the country and on a state level have been passed. And a lot of those also being well-intentioned, if you have a person, if you have, uh, say, a, a wife who's been abused by her spouse, they're going to want to make sure that victim has a safe place to stay, gets the house, make sure they have transportation to and from work, make sure they have the financial resources. But the problem is they get all of that before any real due process is done. The allegations made, they can go and get an ex parte order. And what's, what's ex parte mean? That, that's great. That, that, great question. What that means is one-sided, basically. It means that I could go in, and if I didn't like you, I could say to the judge, fill out some paperwork and say, he started touching my knee, he you know, did this, uh, I objected. He ended up shoving me up against the wall and I'm really, really scared. That judge is gonna side with me and make sure that my interests are protected. And rightly so, and, and many Without cases, me even knowing about yeah, it. Yeah, without you, you even knowing about it. You get the it. order before I'm told about the very fact that you've made any allegations. That's correct. Now, in some senses, that, that is great because the victim really needs to be... Helped to, right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. I don't wanna wait until you follow me home or show up on my doorstep. But on the other end of it, it also is something that really, um, Constitutionally, I don't know if I agree with it all the way because you have a right to really know what's going on instead of finding out two days later when a when a sheriff or a constable shows up on your doorstep or at work or at work in front of all in of front your front of all my coworkers. That's very very common, and that um, is something very very embarrassing. I can tell you from personal experience. So, back off of the tangent that I put you on. So. We want to have these victims protected, and that means you shouldn't be displaced from your home, shouldn't have a hard time getting to work or having uh, access to your financial, uh, a way to meet your financial needs. All of that can be done through a protective order? That's correct. And one of the most um, common uses of a protective order these days, it's used in custody cases. The danger you have- Well again, okay, let's assume that the kids aren't being uh, victimized. Mm -hmm. Why would, why could anyone use a protective order for that purpose? I think that's a very valid question and one that some of our legislators need to really take a, a good look at. Um, I can tell you of personal stories of many people that I've spoken to over the years who have actually had that happen to them. Uh, just recently there was a gentleman, I won't use his name because he lives here locally, but he um, he was going through, had, had some arguments with his wife. They were talking about divorcing. They were still in the home. And I remember giving him some advice. I, for back of, lack of better words, I told him to, to cover his ass, start recording things, make sure that he was, was protected because there is such a high incidence of false allegations. And we'll talk about that incidence in just a little bit. So, so what he did, um, he, he unfortunately didn't listen. He had actually told me, 
my wife would never do that. You know, we're not getting along. But we're getting, we're going to get a divorce, but she would never throw me under the bus. She'd never make false allegations to get an advantage over me. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, sound familiar? To some of you that are listening, I know it does. Because you're here, either because it's too late or because you're thinking that trouble might be brewing. This is a great story. Now, I haven't heard this story, but I think I know how this story ends. And, and sadly, I'm sure most of you probably can, can tell where it's going to end. He got into another little tiff. Uh, all of a sudden, police showed up, and he was hauled away. Now, this gentleman, um, obviously, I'm, I'm taking his word for it, but he um, didn't have any type of violent history in his past. He actually uh, was required to carry a gun for his employment. When somebody gets a protective order against them, that is usually usually requires that your Second Amendment rights are actually removed. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's no exceptions. I think even for police officers, and maybe you know something I don't, but I think even if, like if a police officer who has to carry a gun mm -hmm. gets a protective order against him, essentially he's either got to be, or she, has to be placed someplace else in the department where there's no need to carry a gun, if such a thing exists, or you're out of work. I don't think you, I don't think there's any, that's one of the, no by the way, again, another tangent, but that's one of the knocks on um, these protective orders, that it puts, it puts certain people out of work. It's like, you, I have to carry a gun, it's, it's for the sake of doing my job well, Not, but okay, and we all know, I mean, if you haven't figured it out, put, the, put two and two together. Well, you have now been found to be a danger to somebody, so we're not going to let you have a gun so you can shoot this person. But what if you carry a gun to shoot bad guys and not the victim? So anyway, yeah, so this, this guy... He, he needed, ended up he, losing his job. Uh, because he couldn't carry his gun. Exactly. So then that puts him... By the way, was he accused of gun violence? He was not. No. So um, when these allegations happen, one of the worst things that happen is when it, it does affect your employment. If you're looking for a job, you end up having to take time off to go to court cases. You, even if you're an employee, you still have to take time off. If you're in a situation where you have a requirement to have a gun, like this yeah. gentleman did, he lost his job. So then he lost his ability to hire any type of counsel because it's not a criminal case. You can't get any type of court-appointed counsel. So he has to pay for his own or he has to go in and represent himself. Well, what's so wrong about representing yourself? I mean, you, the, the court will hear the victim, the alleged victim's story, and then you'll get a chance to tell your story and surely reason will prevail. I wish that was the case and I, I really wish our system was built on, on reason and integrity but there's often times in our system where it, it's just not, it doesn't work out that way. Well could you, I mean unless there's something I, I, I cut off, cut you off on, explain to me why I shouldn't feel that way. Why shouldn't I think, well alright this is a bummer that I got falsely accused but thank goodness and, oh, and it's a bummer that I also got this ex parte order against me where I, it was issued without me even having a chance to say anything. But I do get to go to a hearing eventually, right? You do. Okay, it's and so thank goodness that the court is going to finally get to hear both sides of this story. And I'm sure that when the court finds out it's really just one's word against another's, I mean, that's not enough to put me away, is it? Uh, probably not put you away, but in or, in connection what I mean by putting you not in jail. <laughs> That's not, I mean, I mean, in other words, if the court can't tell who's telling the truth, I should win, right? I'm the defendant. You would think so, and that's the way our system is supposed to be set up. But unfortunately, with the burden of proof, once that allegation is made, especially in a family law case, instead of being innocent until proven guilty, you're guilty until proven innocent. Well, wait a minute. Is that the way the law is? I mean, is that the law, or is that just the way it works out? Uh, that is more of the way it works out from yeah, my experience. Because you're right. Um, it's supposed to be, it's not my job to prove I'm innocent. If somebody's going to accuse me of domestic violence or something like that, it's, it's that person's job to prove that th these allegations are accurate, that this person has a valid case. My job is not to prove I didn't do something. Number one, I can't prove a negative. Number two, I'm not, it's not my responsibility to have people shoot their mouths off and then have me come into court and show it, it's, all, it's all fake or it's not true or it doesn't hold any water. And you said an interesting thing before we went on camera that, and actually even right here, like we, we both know there are plenty of couples that argue. And when we talk about fight, we don't mean put up your dukes and, and fight. We're talk, but there's, and there can be screaming and yelling and there can be hurt feelings. And people can still just call up the cops and say, I feel scared, even though I've been using, I've been swearing like a sailor at my husband just as much as he's been swearing. I, feel, I suddenly feel scared. Or 
even better, if you've got the, if you've got the guts, um, he's threatened to kill me when that didn't happen. I mean, so now we're, now we're in court and it's like, okay, look, I've been married for 15, 16, 20 years. My neighbors know me. There's never been a lick of trouble. I don't have a criminal record. Surely that's got to count for something. I'll say, Your Honor, I know she's upset. I know he's upset. We're going to use she simply because the overwhelming number of people that ask for these are women. And the overwhelming number of them that are granted are women. Yeah. There's actually been some studies that show that if you're a man, you have about a 1 in 10 chance of getting one signed off on Same. by a judge. But it's pretty much yeah. the opposite when it's And that's man. great stuff. And so, okay, so here I am in court, Scott. And, uh, you know, she, she gets up. Her lawyer or she said, you know, oh, it was a dark and stormy night. And he's saying, you know, and this happened, that happened. Like that. And then he threatened to kill me. Oh, like and then the guy stands up and says, it was a dark and, stor dark and stormy night. And beyond that, everything else is, is fiction. That didn't happen. Yes, we were arguing. And yeah, we said some nasty things to each other. And I called her some names. And she called me names. But at no point did it ever get violent. At no point did I threaten any violence. By the way, we're going through a divorce. Put two and two together. What happens? Typically, I think the, the judges and the commissioners here in our state and also the judges in other states, they want to err on the side of caution. And they typically extend those ex parte orders, which are meant to be temporary orders until uh, a basis of, of fact can be found out. They usually extend those just out of um, fear of making a mistake. Okay, well, you know, it, what's wrong with, I mean, when, if, it, I mean if, it, if it saves the life of just one person, isn't it worth it? If it ruins the life of 10,000 other people, is it worth it? Yeah. Now, of course, what people will say that, right? Hey, um, and, and that's one thing you and I talked a little bit about. It's like, we, we can sympathize, right? Who wants to be the judge in that, or that commissioner who says, you know, I'm not really sure if there's any merit to this. I'm not sure if this really rises to the level of, of warranting a protective order. Yeah, I'm not going to grant this because, you know what, I have to be fair to both sides. And frankly, that, that, that allegation just seems weak. But I don't really want this person to end up dead next week and have my name in the paper as the person who could have done something and didn't. What do you say to people that might feel that way? One, anytime there's an allegation of domestic violence, there's a crime committed. Either the domestic violence happened and that's a crime or the person making the allegation is lying about so it. So in that's Utah, it is, it is illegal to make a false report of a crime to a law enforcement officer. That is correct. Unfortunately, and this is not just a Utah situation when that happens, it, it happens all across the country. False allegations, especially for domestic violence, nobody does a thing about them. People can make... Well, I mean, when you say nobody, I mean, you know, like maybe one out of ten gets prosecuted, right? Uh, probably about one out of... 10,000, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I happened to speak to one of the district attorneys a while ago and asked that question. And, uh, I, could, I wasn't given any examples of somebody being prosecuted for making a false allegation of domestic violence. Um, do you have any opinions as to why that happens? I, I think there's two main reasons. One, uh, the police departments, if they're supposed to be investigating it, they have too many other things on their to-do list. Same thing with the city and county prosecutors, the AG's office. There's only so many resources, and all those resources are already being used by the false allegations. And so, when you're dealing with allegations of, of violence, no one's really going to get mad that you're not sticking up for the defendant. You know, I mean, that's, well, let's all face it. We all make this mistake. Uh, we, hear, uh, we hear something on the radio or on the, on the news uh, about alleged violence or an alleged uh, uh, assault or something like that. And our first thought is, oh, I hope everyone's okay. Rarely do you go, hmm, I wonder if there's any truth to that. So it's human nature to be concerned for the innocent. Yeah, and we all presume innocence, right? Well, with that, the, the other thing that we have happening, we actually had uh, a woman I know had attended a protective order hearing down in, in uh, one of the southern areas of the valley and there was a commissioner when the case was heard he said basically I'm just rubber stamping this and that, that's kind of the way we do it here with these because we don't want to have like you said they don't want to be the bad ones on the news when somebody does actually go and, and commit violence and there's also that misconception um, I alluded to that a little bit that it's usually the man that's the abusive one that's something that's that's throughout our, our culture or society that's kind of a, a myth that's out there 
Um, study after study after study shows that domestic violence isn't a gender issue. Women and men typically abuse at similar rates. In fact, half of all domestic violence is mutual. That means, uh, you know, if I hit you, you're hitting me, it's, it's something like that. Of the other 50%, uh, typically, uh, it's around 60 to 70 percent of the time it's a woman actually instigating the domestic now, violence. Now come on Scott, that's from some guy with an axe to grind who himself admits that he's gone through a divorce. And, well, uh, come on, and, and I mean, you can see you know, that 60 to 70 percent are, are perpetrators are women? I mean that sounds, we all, I mean look at the prisons. I mean What's the ratio of men to women in the prisons when it comes to violent crime, my friend? And, and that's a great point. And I mentioned earlier about the likelihood of a man being arrested. Even though all these studies, and, and there's not just one, it's not just, I mean, there are studies by m multiple universities, multiple organizations, they all point to this. Yeah, action. but they're all funded by axe to grind bitter men. I would, would love to see how that was traced back to bitter men. There's even women. Uh, there was actually, a, a, I would say, a feminist organization that had done a study regarding um, some things a while back. Mm -hmm. They didn't actually release all of their, their information that they found. A lot of these studies are peer-reviewed studies, so they're not something where it's just, you know, men hating women or whatever, mm -hmm. and that's not the point of me bringing it's up that not, It's not some organization going after the stats it desires. Yeah. There are some people who are willing to start with a blank slate, and what they discover may surprise us sometimes. And, and that's the thing, it's not a gender issue, and I wasn't saying that to make it a gender issue. But you and I both know there are a lot of people, a lot of rational people, that are going to say, well, there are certain things you can always count on, you know. Most babies are cute, there's death, there's taxes, and most domestic violence perpetrators are men. I mean, that's as, as sure as the sun rises, we can count on something like that. Would you agree that there are people that feel that way? I, I think that's something that was kind of ingrained in us in society. Have you ever seen a protective order uh, pamphlet or a domestic violence or a child abuse pamphlet that shows a mother abusing the child? No. I can show you yeah. statistics from CPS, from the uh, Health and Human Services, that show that mothers actually abuse children at a higher rate. Oh yeah, they usually get custody more, so there's probably some skewing of numbers there. But either way, abuse, domestic violence, all Well, that's true. I mean, you can't, you can't abuse your kids if you don't get near them yeah, very yeah, often. Yeah, if you only have them four days a month, <laughs> what's the likelihood that's going to happen? So yeah. the, the point is, is that domestic violence and, and child abuse, those types of things, it's not a gender issue. It's something that happens. Men, men do it. Women do it. Uh, no matter who does it, it's wrong. Same thing with those false allegations. Uh, if I'm making a false allegation to get ahead in a custody case, that's something that is incredibly wrong. It damages the child, it damages the real victims, and it also damages the parent that those allegations have been made against. Well, that's all well and good, but what can be done? I mean, wh what could be some real world solutions right now? Um, one thing, and, and this is me speaking for me, uh, something that I would love to see is actually some accountability in the system. I would love to see, like you said, Instead of zero or one in 10,000, it's probably one and a half a million that actually get prosecuted. It would be nice to see an actual investigation be done anytime there's an allegation. Uh, anytime a protective order is issued, you don't even have to have a police report. You don't have to have any type of proof that there's been any type of history. You can just go in with a blank slate and say, oh, yep, she's been beating me or he's been beating me. Get that ex parte order, chances are it's gonna get moved into a permanent order. The thing that I would love to see is that that allegation is being made that there was a domestic violence incident, that there's actually a police investigation done. So that if, there, if, if a woman really is being victimized by her spouse, mm -hmm. she needs help. She needs the assets of the victim advocate with the police department. She needs representation that that would allow. She needs all of those resources, or he. Uh, just like if a person is having false allegations, they need those same resources and that same type of and just so this doesn't come across as awkward, I mean, it bears repeating. There are men out there, plenty of them, too many of them, who beat up on innocent, defenseless women. If there's too many men and there's too many women. Right. Domestic violence is an issue right. that's... Is this, is this a women have had it too easy for too long kind of conversation? I, I would not say so. I am, I'm, I'm currently married. I love my wife. And, you know, if somebody... Um, luckily, her ex was, was not any, any type of person like that, but um, if he was, I would want to make sure that she had those type of protections. I would want to make sure just the same. Um, when she went, 
funny story here, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but when she went in, uh, was working through a divorce with her attorney, hopefully she doesn't kill me for saying this, uh, she, he actually kind of was priming her a little bit. Well, can, can you say that he did this? Well, can, can we do this? What about, you know, if he uh, ever made you scared, we could do this, and then you don't have to worry about yep. custody. And, and unfortunately, there's those types of behaviors that are happening. Um, as representatives of the court, attorneys are doing that, some unethical ones out there. And it's the system, I think it's not a, a against women system or anything, or you know, they had it too easy too long. I think it's the system has been broken for way too long. Yeah. The true victims aren't really getting the services that they need, and those who have been... If, if it's not so much then about protecting women, why is it so entrenched then? I mean, do you think that these judges and commissioners really believe there's this level of domestic violence going on as reported in the court records? I would love to sit down with the judge and ask him some questions sometime like that. I, yeah. I haven't had the, the opportunity to... Well, we, you and I both know that there's been some, uh, some of that done, both in Utah and elsewhere, and the answers that I've gotten are, oh no, there's no bias, there's no favoritism. Uh, but I have my opinions on that, and I'm not afraid to share them because I think that most reasonable people would say, okay, that doesn't surprise me either. Of course the courts and the judges can't say that there's bias or favoritism. If they did that, they'd be out of a job. And I'm not trying to be too cynical here, but there may be some that don't see themselves as biased or showing favoritism, but what that is is it's, it's laziness. I don't want to have to analyze this whole case. Got somebody alleging abuse. Who's going to criticize me for issuing a protective order? Don't just, do, don't just stand there, do something, right? When it really ought to be, don't just do something, stand there. Hey, Your Honor, is there a preponderance of evidence here, or is it really just he said, she said? If that's what it is, deny it. And have the guts to live with your decision. If you're afraid, that you're going to make a mistake, and Lord knows everybody can, judges and commissioners are human, but if you're so afraid that your mistake by denying uh, a protective order might end up with somebody being badly injured or killed, well then why don't we just issue a protective order to everybody? Because that way no one can be held accountable for getting it wrong. I mean, th why do you have no problem making other decisions, you know, you win this contract dispute and you lost, even though it turns out that you shouldn't have lost. I mean, oh, it's only money, this is more serious. Well, not to the person who's going to the courts believing in the system. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, one thing I guess if I had a chance to really sit down with, with some of the commissioners and some of the judges, if I could take a little piece of knowledge, I guess, and just plug it in and have them understand something, when you have a parent who's making a false allegation, that person typically has some major mental issues. It might be just a situational thing with the divorce, or maybe something more long term, but they may have borderline personality. And that's disorder. good that you, in other words, you're saying when people make false allegations, most of these people aren't pure evil. They're under either the, fa they're either crazy, for lack of a, you know, a more clinical term, <laughs> or they're in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. Some of these people that will kill somebody, they're not murderers, but they were so angry and so worked up that they, 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 in a, they, they, they accidentally killed somebody. Or they, did, they knew they were killing somebody, but like, I was out, literally out of my mind with rage. I'm a peaceful person. I, I feel terrible about this. So you're saying there's either people that are unhinged, and they'll ask for a protective order, and they'll say anything else in the course of this divorce or this child custody proceeding. But then there's another group of people that they're not bad people, they're not crazy people, but they can be, for a moment, just so seized with anger and violent or, or, or fright or whatever the word. Is that what you're saying? Okay, because I think it's important. To know. We're not saying that everybody who asks for a protective order is crazy. No. We're maybe. not saying that everybody who accuses somebody of domestic violence is a liar or yeah. out of touch with reality. No, but when if they're doing it fraudulently, if they're if they're willing to commit a felony act, if they're willing to do those types of things or do a parental kidnapping, and they're, usually it's those types of people who are the ones who do custodial interference and parental kidnappings and things as well. So if they are willing to do those types of behaviors and fraudulently accuse somebody just to gain the upper hand, uh, that 
little control mechanism they have to have control that's not going to be a good environment for that child uh, I mentioned when I talked about our organization in the beginning that we were really focused on shared parenting mm -hmm. if you have one parent who does that type of behavior anytime you really have child abuse there's really two types of child abuse you either have a pathological parent one that's just just crazy and a really bad parent and never should have been one or you have somebody who's really just pushed to the breaking point the kid's been mouthing off for days and days and days and finally they just snap if you were to focus on making sure that the child still had a relationship with both parents despite protective orders uh, that's the other thing it keeps the kids from being able to have a relationship uh, no contact orders are usually extended for those children even right? if there's no allegation of child abuse that is correct yeah so uh, with that when you have one single parent who has all the control like that man you know, or woman man or woman I uh, just have some statistics I'd like to share with you there's a 64 percent greater risk of emotional neglect of the child in a single parent home in a single parent home there's 165 percent greater risk of physical neglect which neglect wait, wait a minute how can how can you have 165 percent an increase of, so say right. but there's only one per that's because not only are you in exposing the child at, uh, to the risk of abuse at the hands of the parent but at the risk of uh, but the abuse of who else that boyfriends in, girlfriends that, that does happen roommate. and so that's where the 165 comes from right because what you're saying is it's not just that single parent now yeah the well, risk of abuse goes up because of the elements that single parent might be living in and that is the single parent uh, on the abuse statistics with the uh, with with CPS and, and HHS the and again this is not something that uh, is really against women but the mothers are typically the, the highest rate of abusers for physical abuse and again um, that might be because they have more opportunities the, yes but there's still a lot of abuse going on regardless yes, of, of it, why exactly from there it usually goes to the, um, the stepfather or boyfriend uh, from there it goes to the, the biological father and the stepmother or, or girlfriend mm -hmm. so uh, step siblings yeah, people people in the apartment you live in yeah. goes on and on yeah and, and really I, I do believe that like I said some of that is because there are the pathological parents that are going to be doing that abuse but on the other end there's also if you have one parent who has the child 90% of the time and the other parent only gets to see him four days a month, that parent that has him 90% of the time, that it can take an emotional toll on a parent, uh, any good parent, uh, especially if you have uh, you know, a couple kids, they're going through emotional upheaval with the divorce and with all that stress, they're going to be acting out, they're going to be struggling in school, uh, yeah. they're going to be getting into drugs, they're going to be having premarital sex, all those right. things. Are I mean a single parent is fighting with one hand tied behind his or her back because there's only one parent, not two. Exactly. So um, in addition to neglect, uh, some other statistics, if on a single parent family, 77 percent greater uh, risk of physical abuse, 80 percent greater risk of serious injury from the abuse or neglect. So okay. those are some serious numbers. If um, Obviously, we want to make sure that uh, domestic violence victims are protected, that children are protected, because there are some really horrible men and women out there. But the thing, if we could focus on getting rid of the estimated 2 to 2.3 million fraudulent protective orders per year in the United States, or ones that don't meet any type of... Um, that don't meet the standard, standard, right. If we could take all the resources that we're putting into those 2.3 million cases and allocate that to the true victims of abuse, that could make life-altering changes. That could make a big difference. The other thing is, is that if we would actually give people with no criminal records who've been married for any length of time the benefit of the doubt and quit running to say, well, better safe than sorry, abundance of caution, uh, it takes a toll, and I'm surprised that people don't notice it. I mean, you've got the, uh, I lost my job because they said, hey, you know, we're a, we're a family-oriented company and we just can't have people that are, uh, you know, that are abusers here. It's like, but I'm innocent. Like, well, but you've been accused, and that word's gotten out. Then it's, you know, it's, it's at your social club or your, your church, your parish, your ward. Uh, it can really isolate somebody, and it can really take a toll. And then... What happens is, like you mentioned, kids start to say, well, I'm not stupid. I can see that this parent's being shunned. Perhaps I should as well. Yes. So. Yeah, alienation of affection is uh, another big thing that does happen as a result of false allegations. Um, 
the children are, are oftentimes confused. They don't know what to do. All of a sudden, mom was in the picture. Now she's not, and you know, dad's saying that mom's mean, and or vice versa. And you know, dad's no longer in the picture, and, and that really does a lot of psychological abuse to the child, and also. Uh, damages that relationship. Even in, if you have a really strong relationship between parent and child, once those allegations get in there, uh, the other parent's able to isolate the, the child away, that's when real emotional abuse oh, can happen. Yeah, and just and let those doubts creep in. Gee, I never, I never noticed this before, but maybe, maybe I was being abused and didn't even realize it. Or maybe I was at risk. Well, Scott, I appreciate this, and I'd like to have you back again, because we could talk about some other things. Uh, the point that we're here to make today is that what you think you know about domestic violence generally, who does it, why, why it's committed, how the legal system is set up to address it, is not good. And there are too many, far too many innocent people who are just being kind of run over by the machine in the name of, well, in the name of protect, protecting people when underneath that we're dealing with just some apathy, some bigotry, some sexism, some just just some intellectual laziness. Uh, we're allowing this. We're allowing, like you said, good people, good intentions, to be manipulated and exploited. And what I mean, this is my, my opinion: is the damage done to the innocents far outstrips the benefits of just being so so cautious. What, what would you say to that? I think that th there are good things. We, we know people get abused. I think the whole system, if you could overhaul it and start it all over, that would be great. But unfortunately, you'd have to change everybody out there's mindsets, you know, that men are always the abuser. Uh, domestic violence shelters throughout the United States, there's really not any that cater just to men or men and children. It's always women or women and children. And that's something that's just culturally, because we want to, uh, typically, I'm, you're, you're a man, I'm a man. Right. We, we're wired, we're engineered to protect, I guess, or that's something in our instincts to protect our, our women and our lives and our children. Um, but unfortunately, that's only serving half of the people who are victims. And then you also have a lot of people, like I said, who are manipulating that system and who are continuing to abuse it. So I, I think, if we could scrap the whole system, that would be wonderful. I know that's not really feasible, but uh, I think the real reform could come in holding people accountable for false allegations. And in turn, if there's a, a high burden of proof for abuse and that is met, there needs to be people being held accountable who are actually abusing as well. Um, if, if a man, woman, or child has been physically hurt, that perpetrator really should be in jail for a very long time. Because that's a, it's al already a crime. Yes. It does seem to be kind of two different layers. Well, thanks very much. Would you like to come back and just do some a stats program? Would yeah, that be I'd, something I'd, we'd I'd, like to do? Yeah, I'd be happy to do I look that. forward to that then. So thank you for watching. We hope you found this interesting, and we hope to see you back again sometime. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you.